Welcome to Conversations with Kerry. Good to have you back with us today. I am very lucky I'm sitting here in the Finder offices. Now, Finder are a media partner for the Gold and Alternative Investments Conference coming up 24th to the 26th of October. If you haven't already booked your tickets, go to the link below, goldevent.com.au and register. You will not be sorry because there's going to be a lot of fabulous information that we're going to share. But I wanted to speak with James. James is the, uh, he looks after marketing and operations and pretty much a hell of a lot of things at Hivex. And you're all going, what's Hivex? Well, Hivex is an over-the-counter desk, and I'm going to ask James a little bit more about that at, in, in a minute. Um, James is also responsible for helping me put together the Alternative Investments Day, which is really a digital day. We're going to talk about that as well. Yep. Clearly, he's a lot younger than me, so he understands a lot more about this sort of stuff than I do. So, James, welcome to the program. Good to see you. Thanks, Thanks so much for having me. Good to see you. Likewise. And uh, I'm glad I snaffled you as you walk past. I was like, get yep. in here, let's have a chat. Wrangle me in. So... Tell me, what is an over-the-counter desk? What does that mean? Yeah, absolutely. So Hivex, and, and also, sorry, and who is Hivex? Yeah, so we're, we're an over-the-counter desk or uh, brokerage, you could say, and effectively we're specialised in trading larger amounts of cryptocurrencies. Okay. And that can be from cryptocurrency A to B, like Bitcoin to Ethereum, or oh, wow. also um, we've got a huge range of support for fiat currencies. So we see a lot of like Australian dollars coming in or US dollars in. We can settle in pretty much everything with banking in different countries. So So are, let me ask you this. So, because um, I'm trying to explain it from my, my point yeah, of view. Okay, yeah, so sure. I've got money in, let's say, Lloyds Bank in London. Yep. And I want to bring it back here, but I want to keep it in pounds. Can I do that on the Hivex platform? Um, or, well, no, because you would send your pounds to like a bank in Australia that receives pounds, right? See, I told you but I'm not if very you good had, at all this. If you had... Um, like, that's not really the, the market that we're servicing. So I guess it's like if you had pounds and you wanted to buy Bitcoin, yep. we can help you. Great. Right? If you had Bitcoin and you wanted pounds, we can help you, regardless of pretty much where you are. Okay. Um, so we service globally. We've got banking that can settle globally. Okay. Um, what we're really doing is trading in and out of Bitcoin to fiat or Bitcoin to other cryptocurrencies. Right. Right. And so... Uh, so is Bitcoin like the base, is it? It, so it to tends to be the largest asset that we're, we're, that we're involved with. Like a lot of people are either buying it or selling it um, much at a much greater volume than we see for things like Ethereum and Ripple and other cryptocurrencies. Okay. But we can, we can service literally anything in about the top 60 uh, in terms of the market cap of the crypto, cryptocurrency. Uh, but basically as you work your way down the list, there's less liquidity. Of course. Yeah. Um, and as, a, as an OTC, what this means is it's not <coughs> over the counter like... I think people still think it's like you go in somewhere. It's all digital, but it's over the counter in terms that we're specialized in large order trades. So starting at $50,000 right. and higher. Okay. Right. Now, why is that? Why large trades? Why not any size? Um, I think, uh, I mean, the simple answer is that our founder, Fred Schbester, saw an opportunity that he felt like he could fill. Uh, and so he did. Okay. Um, but I think it's really like why OTC, like why would you use an OTC like us? Um, it's basically like if you're using an exchange, you're limited with the amount of liquidity on that exchange. So what that means is that if you're trying to buy a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars of Bitcoin, you have to go and find an exchange and then you're basically buying it off the people on that exchange. Right. And who they, and so it's a, it's a depth problem. Okay. So what ends up happening is you end up buying down an order book of you buy this person's amount at this price and then you pay slightly more for the next. Yeah, the next, until you fill your order. And you eat away. Where mm. what we can do is basically give an entire price, one price for the whole amount. Okay. And we're able to do that through, uh, there's a number of ways that we do it, but basically it's uh, institutional par partnerships. So partnerships with players that don't face retail audiences at all. Uh, admittedly, our audience is not so much retail. It's, I was about to say, is your it's high net worth, when, yeah. but also, I guess I look at retail in two prongs, right? You've got retail being not high worth, high net worth, but even people with a lot of capital can still be considered retail if their understanding of what they're doing is is less, right? Yeah. Because uh, they have a retail mindset, their incentives, their choices are, are, are similar to mm -hmm. someone that's just trying to to get in. It's the same thing yeah. in, in yeah. a lot of ways. So. I'd say like we have a lot of institutional clients and businesses and high net worth individuals that uh, that know what they're doing and are traders. 
uh, or investors. And then we do have people that just have a huge amount of capital and think, oh, okay, I'll put 1% into Bitcoin uh, without putting too much more thought into it. Right. Okay. And so it's kind of like... And how did they come across you? I mean, how long has Hybex been going? Uh, since February of last year. Okay, so fairly new. Um, fairly new. Um, I think it's been fortunate for us that we are um, basically the... We sit within Finder Ventures, and so right. we've been able to leverage that to get these um, institutional partners. Um, where I think it's there's a fairly high barrier to, to entering this kind of space. Okay, yeah. But um, we we think it's great because we we sort of fit in this nice little area between uh, institutions that don't want to face thousands of customers or clients because okay. they just want to deal with like they just want a massive pipeline of big other other big institutions. Right. Okay. And so um, we give basically our clients access to better pricing than they could get on exchanges or elsewhere. And uh, we service that for the institutions. They don't have to deal with onboarding and upskilling. We teach a lot of clients how to store cryptocurrency safely okay. and things like that. Um, yep. And there's a fair amount of, uh, I guess we call it like silk glove service. Like we're, okay. we're available 24-7, 365, trade on weekends, trade late at night. If a client wants us there, we're there. And we're able to sort of fill that gap, which is the institutions are happy they're not really interested in that side. And our clients are obviously happy because they're able to get better prices. And and clearly this fills something, there was a niche there that wasn't being serviced before. Yeah. Well, it's, it's like a market that's maturing, right? And yeah. so I think we've seen a lot of development in exchanges uh, over the last couple of years. Um, I mean, it's not what it used to be. Back in the day, you would like go into your bank and do an international bank transfer to yeah. Japan and yeah. buy your Bitcoin off a company called Mt. Gox. Ah uh, yes, and like we we've all, all had, about, you know, about Gox. Um, and, and that went under, and and I think it was like, um, oh, actually, I'm not even going to try and guess. It was a huge amount of, I think it was like 800. It was a big chunk of change. It was a lot. Yeah. Um, and that made people I very say 800, nervous. Eight hundred thousand Bitcoin, but that seems way off. It's yeah. been a while since I've looked. Um, but now we've got all sorts of different options for how you can buy cryptocurrency. If you want to put fifty dollars in a week, there's ways that you can automatically have that done. Right. Through Hyvex? Not through us. No, okay. But I just mean like just, the market's mean matured the market? a lot. We saw yeah. an opportunity to service one area the big of end. it. Yeah. Um, yep. And so that's that's sort of been our focus. Um, we'd love to look at uh, over time improving how we can lower our our trade size minimums. Yep. So that we can get better pricing for for the retail for side as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's it's just like a as tech improves, as automation improves, we, we think we'll get there. So it's pretty exciting. Well, you and I spoke, so um, what I did was um, I met Fred Shabester, who is the founder of founder of Finder, uh, co-founder of Finder, yep. and um, <coughs> I spoke to him about gold and digital. And Fred's eyes lit up because he said to me, he sees that how those two can sit next to each other, but clearly I don't know very much about the digital side of thing, but one thing that I did know was that people were going to get into trouble if they didn't know it. So mm. what I've done is I've asked James to come in and um, pretty much put the whole agenda together for me, which you've done. But I'd like you just to share with me why we're doing it yeah. and what people should expect when they come along on the t Saturday, the 26th of October. Yeah, awesome. Absolutely. So I think like for us, it makes a lot of sense. We see a lot of synergies between gold and digital assets or yeah. cryptocurrency. Um, specifically Bitcoin at least, um, where, I mean, the same, the people that are buying gold are hedging against the same kind of risk that the people who are buying yeah, good point. Bitcoin, mm. like they're effectively the same. What differs, I think, is uh, obviously gold has a lot more long-term historical support for it, right? Mm -hmm. It dates back like thousands of years or whatever it is. And so sure. people, people feel a lot more comfortable with that. Um, and I think that while there's you know, a good chance of a uh, good upside for gold. I think people are flocking to Bitcoin as a way of um, comparatively seeing it as potentially having that same sort of longer term store of value, but perhaps with a different sort of growth um, potential. But um, are people, but are people that, that are investing in Bitcoin, and I'm talking about those that don't know very much, but a lot of people actually, yeah. it's, it's very, it's volatile. It's very speculative yep. and it's not... So for me, I look at gold and I go, that is for me, it's yep. a store of wealth, it protects my wealth, uh, it's potentially how I can um, improve the generational wealth because yep. I can let it sit there, its return yep. has been on average 9%. Whereas Bitcoin, I mean, yesterday we had a little bit of a whoop, um, yep. a, a fall off, off the cliff again. It's very volatile. Are yep. people 
using it as an investment vehicle or are they just speculators watch and trading it going trading it between the ranges um i think there's well you've got both right you've got investors um that might be looking more at um its use as a technology and what it what it means more broadly i think that there's there's a pretty like I don't think it's too bad, but there's a learning curve to understanding what the technology is behind Bitcoin. Absolutely. Um, and there's lots of funny things around wrapping your head around how to secure it and things like that. That I mean, gold, if you're holding it physically, it's it's pretty like you put it somewhere safe. Yeah. Um, and it's actually quite similar. Bitcoin, you might have a special key that backs up your Bitcoin and you put that somewhere safe. Right. Um, but I think you've got speculators, absolutely. And the volatility is great for them, right? Because they, they trade on that, up or down. Yeah. Um, uh, at least the ones that know what they're doing do that. Um, you have a lot of people, I think, uh, yeah, I think it's fair to say that um, Bitcoin, and especially more broadly the cryptocurrency space, it does attract, I would say, the same kind of people that fall into things like Ponzi schemes and pyramid schemes. Yeah, yeah. Right? Because yeah. it has that, it has that um, previous history of enormous growth, and then it has that really easy, get rich quick kind of vibe, right? And yeah. it's completely fair. I think it does. Um, and so I think it attracts those people. And they might be the ones that fall more into speculative side. Sure. Uh, more in towards um, perhaps moving it out of Bitcoin into other investments within the cryptocurrency space that might not have the tech to back them. Right. Um, things that are literally just like a stack of papers and a promise of what's yes. going to happen. Yeah. Right. And so like very heavy, it, it like it, 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 those people love it. Right? right. And they're attracted to it. But I think uh, in saying that you have a whole other side that looks at how can the technology be applied and what are the actual benefits that can be leveraged from that. Mm. Um, and you can't really get to that point without understanding some of the fundamentals. Right. Which I think, 100%. Um, I guess in a roundabout way is, is what this day is about. Yeah. So it's really, um, you know, uh, structured to take people from, having a very high level or no understanding and then understanding that would be me that, yeah well, it's <laughs> lots of people right it's everyone at one point yeah. um and then basically layering in um in, in as much of a creative way as we can like what is a blockchain and what components make a blockchain strong and secure and if a blockchain is strong and secure w what can we do with that right and so like the number one thing for me is like um it's about trust Sure. So you have a, a thing that you can put trust into uh, and you can expect that thing to stay and not disappear. Yeah, I know that that's and not be brutal, compromised. Right? And, yeah. and so a lot of people think of Bitcoin as a, as a gold competitor or as a form of payment and money and stuff. But really, um, its use in that space is an application of what you can get if you can put trust into an, a blockchain, into a network. So if I have a Bitcoin and I send it to you, yep. we can all see that that transaction occurs. Can I ever claim it back from you? Or can I send it to you and someone else at the same time and then take one back and right. I've received my subway? Like if I've bought a sandwich off you and at the same time I've sent that money elsewhere, what stops me from cancelling my one with you after I've walked away? Right. So when you have a solution for that, you're able to start using it as money, right? You're able to start using it as an asset. And okay. so... Basically, and, and I, I'm guessing I don't know how to do this in 10 minutes, right? Yeah. But the whole day is trying to explain why we have a network that we can trust. Right. Right. And, and it's basically a decentralized network. We have people in different spots geographically. Yes. Financially incentivized to secure this network, to make sure I can't spend Bitcoin here and here at the same time. Okay. And that's the technology. But what it really means is that we can trust it. So I can also put information into a transaction and send it. I can put a little trust, like a house, my, my deed, right, into okay. a small transaction, costs a fraction of a cent, send it, and then we can look at that blockchain later and say, here's the proof. I did send it, right? you did receive it. I did send it, you did receive it, yep. and there's an enormous financial cost on trying to later change it. Who are going to be the winners and the losers in this new age world that we, this digital world, and does it mean, like uh, right now, very, very, very few people in in a global sense are using Bitcoin as a as a form of payment. Would yeah. I be right? A hundred percent. I think um oh there's just so many so many things that you can touch on to be honest. Um winners and losers and uh Bitcoin is a form of payment. I, I think it's important to to probably make this point is that the way I see it at least is you have verticals. 
verticals of problems that blockchain can solve. Okay. And specific cryptocurrencies within a, like specific blockchains can solve. Okay. So at current, Bitcoin's not trying to solve being used as cash, as money to pay for coffee. Right. It's it's trying to make itself secure and robust so that you can trust it. Okay. Like proper trust it and it's not going to go down. And it's not there yet? It's there. Okay. But the reason that you can't use it to buy a coffee is because it's the the community that support it are not willing to make any sacrifice on its stability and security to include a way for it to move faster so that it could do smaller amounts uh, faster. Okay. It's not that it couldn't if the community wanted it to. Uh, it's that it's not going to give up its pole position as a st- as a trustworthy store of value, like whatever that value is, yep. financial or like a perceived value. Okay. Um, but then you might have another blockchain that comes in and says, we're going to be a little bit more rogue, but we're going to be 100 times faster and 100 times cheaper. And so the way I look at that is basically you would have your Bitcoin, which would be like you can have it and forget about it. And then if you want to buy, do things like buy coffee, you would basically buy into that other cryptocurrency a smaller amount. Because then it's like if you have a couple of hundred dollars in there, if that blockchain goes under... It's not the end of the world. It's not the end of the world. And then you have things like privacy coins. So like if I, if I really value privacy and I want to be able to send something to you and have no one ever be able to identify that. You have coins that do that. And there's wow. basically, they, they trade pros and cons. And a lot of the time it's a new advantage or a new edge at the cost of security and um, trust. I guess so, I, it, 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 yeah, it is it's, really it's interesting, hole, but I, but it is a bit of a it is a bit of a rabbit hole because you know we're born, we go to school, our parents use cash, they have bank accounts, and yeah. and that's the way it's always been done. So it's rather like when computers first started, it was like, ah, how yeah. does this work? But they've been for sure. around for so long, and now they're everywhere. Yeah. But right now, we to me, it feels it does feel like a rabbit warren of. Yeah what the heck and there's so many different and i think that's why we're doing this day but i guess my question is why do we need it i think we need it because you can start to uh, get some really interesting benefits from using it and so probably the main one that people would know about bitcoin is the idea that it's a permissionless blockchain so you can go and buy bitcoin however you do that through something like us through an exchange off another person and then there's no body or entity that can ever prevent you from being able to use it, send it. You, you control it. And so what, what happens if there's, um, I don't know, uh, the government shuts down every exchange because they just deem them illegal. Yep. And we have uh, the climate change activists come in and shut down all the electricity so I can't do anything. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. playing or crazy like, stuff. Yeah, no, hey. that's completely, that's fine. Yeah, I think another one you can throw in there is like if the internet goes down. Well, that's kind of like there's no electricity. Internet's yeah, gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I think for that one, it's kind of this, um, it, it wouldn't be fun. Um, but also I think that it's probably the least of like, if electricity goes down, it's not just Bitcoin that is falling apart, right? No. Um, and But you're right. It is kind of like that distant elephant in the room. Like, how do we address that? Mm. Um, you know, and there are satellites that stream the blockchain. Um, Are there? Okay. Yeah. Um, and so you can basically reach that with the satellite. Wow. Um, but that's like, you can, it, it's the rabbit hole, right? And so you can do yeah. all sorts of crazy stuff on the sides. Yeah. But I think, um, what was your first question? Um, well, the, the question is that, you know, we're, we're so used to... Oh, sorry, government. Government. Shutting it down, right. So I would say that the, the risk of a government to intervene too heavily, yep. it's this balance of regulation versus innovation. Mm-hmm. Right. So a government not, might not be able to stop you from moving Bitcoin, but they might be able to regulate a business like HiveX exactly. from being able to trade it and use it. Yes. Right? And we are actually seeing interesting things in play like that. Um, and so the main argument I would say is that when a government does that and they get the balance of innovation versus regulation wrong, because the regulation is important, you need to protect consumers. I agree. And, yep. and like, that's completely fine. Um, but if they get that wrong, what, what the consequence that they risk is that that country will slow down in terms of its innovation. Right. Talented individuals will leave mm-hmm. and they'll go wherever they, they can actually be talented. Right. Um, and when we're looking at some of the applications of blockchain, it's fairly significant. Um, the ways that it can be applied completely even outside of money. Um, we're talking about the ability to own digital assets. Right. And the first use case that everyone gets familiar with is money. 
So one Bitcoin's worth X dollars and I can, sure. I can spend it. Yep. Uh, or I can keep it there for three years and maybe the price, I get lucky. Exactly. Cool, yeah. so speculation, whatever it is. Yeah. But uh, for me at least, the most interesting stuff is when we start to build layers that sit on top of blockchains. So um, leveraging transactions to store trust of data. And mm -hmm. so you start to have ways to build applications where like you might um, like all at the moment Facebook owns all your photos. Yes. Right. And they can see that. And as engineers, they can see that. And there's risk there where there's plenty of things coming out where you can own your own your photos like they're your asset. And so, which they kind of are. But which they should just, be. You, they, yeah, exactly. Right? And if you imagine all of the data of all your social media platforms building up, and they all leverage it for marketing and advertising. Absolutely. There's things like you could you could own all that data as you, and when I open my phone to look at what you're up to, I'm literally requesting it from you and you're approving it. And there's no third party there's that no holds third party. it. Right? And the way that you can do that is by leveraging blockchains to be able to secure uh, basically that data in like a... In, in, in its a own little world. home. And then have <coughs> keys and, and authorizations for it. And so if I want to see advertising, maybe I let the advertisement come to me and I get paid for it. And a little bit of money goes into my little... Like there's all sorts of crazy He's things. He's a very and smart like, young man, isn't he? <laughs> but that's like... Um, it's the use cases that get exciting. If there's platforms um, in progress that are looking like they'll happen where like if, I, if I'm a music artist and I go like and upload that, that little sound bite of something I created, if someone comes along and puts that in their song and their song goes big. Yes, you get a little. I can get a little <coughs> automated payment. Automated because you can have contracts. Because that's one of the big challenges. Look, funnel out, right? This is this is really interesting because this is a challenge. Right? I mean, I hear people say, "I don't want Facebook to own my stuff." Yeah, and I don't, so there's well, there's a lot of trust problems, right? With governments, with everything. Well, everything. Everything. Business. Big business. So, is this some of the stuff we're going to cover on the Absolutely. on the Saturday? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we've basically tried to structure it like understanding what trust is. Yep. Understanding who the participants of a blockchain are, because it's not just one person that makes decisions. There's no mm -hmm. like CEO, there's no board of directors. Yeah. There's you know it's kind of a people like you and me. Field. There's yeah. developers. There's exchanges. There's you know um, there's lots of people that contribute to making sure that it works. And if one of them gets an edge that's unfair to the others, the others will come in. The others will come in to make sure it doesn't happen, or the entire blockchain fails. Right. Right. And loses the incentive mechanism. Like. So who? What? What sort of people should be coming? to this I think um, when we started out, obviously it's you've got a, Australia's largest gold conference for, for the decade, right? And so I think it's really awesome that you're bringing digital assets and alternative, like whatever you... Um, whichever way we want to... Yeah. Whichever way we want to cut it. And yeah. I, think, I think for me at the start, it's like gold bugs I'm really curious about because I think there's been a lot of gold versus Bitcoin stuff. There has been a um, bit. But what we're seeing is that... Um, uh, you know, clients are taking positions in both. Absolutely. They're both hedging against the same things. Some, uh, you know, gold is perceived to have a much more established, it's gold. Like, yeah, it's it feels, solid, I can see it, yeah. I can feel it. There's that, and then, and then there's the kind of excitement around, it's like, uh, I think people, I, I at least make the idea that it's like, it's like if you could invest in the internet. Yeah, why then, wouldn't you? Then it doesn't matter which company succeeds on the internet. Yeah. Right, and so if you're investing in Bitcoin, um, you're kind of, from, I think it's equivalent to the, the internet, right? Yeah. You're, you're investing somewhere that other things will build on top of. Got it. And if they're using it, it means it's being used. Okay. And so that's the, that's my thoughts anyway. So people from gold backgrounds are starting to get excited about that. Yep. They're not going, get rid of gold, get a hundred percent Bitcoin. No. But they're starting to take more of a look at it. Yeah. Then you have people with no gold background that want to learn more about cryptocurrency and I think they should come. Right. That's obviously like this. It's so, the same. Anyone so wants people, to learn. So it, I guess it's for every, think, it's like, really for everybody, isn't it? Except if you're a very sophisticated and you know everything about. Even then, like. Even then, there's still going to be new stuff. Yeah, we we have plenty of institutional background, uh, financial market, traders, investors, and it's hard to wrap your head around like because there's you've got Bitcoin. That's like the bread and butter, and if you understand that and why that has an argument for strong value. Then you can start to go, and what's this new thing? And how does that work? Okay, I don't think that makes sense. Where yeah. if you come in and you don't have any any way to uh, uh, differentiate, like it's not about your background in markets, you know, like you'll, yeah. you'll come in and you'll invest in things that didn't have legs to begin with from a tech point. Sure. And so there's like this marriage, and maybe things trade 
in patterns and, and they can do that side. But um, it's really like everyone has to go through this hurdle. There's a learning curve. There's a learning curve. It's not actually... We're bringing the learning curve to insane. you. I, I think it's just there's some principles, right? Okay. Um, well, you, know you know what? We're going to hear more about yeah, this yeah. at the conference because he loves it. He loves it. Yeah. And you're going to be the chair of the day. So yep. you're going you're gonna to start us off and give us the basics. Yep. Absolutely. And then we've got a bunch of amazing speakers throughout the yeah, day. Really but good. you're also going to be, you've got an exhibition booth. Yep. So you guys, Hivex will be there to answer questions through the whole of the three days. Yep. Because I know you're going to get lots of lots and lots of questions. Um, and we hope to see lots of you there because this is going to be a day digital is not going away. Bitcoin is not disappearing. We need to understand what's coming uh, and what's going to happen in the future. So instead of sticking our heads in the sand, let's get educated. And I want to thank James for joining me this morning. Wonderful. Great Thanks to see much. you. See you soon. See you, rock stars. See you at the gold event. Bye.